This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. Part of what a business owner needs to do before they start to hire employees is to think about some key policies they need to put in place. Now what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is not try to go through all the policies you should have in place, but to give you some ideas on, about some policies that I think are especially important. As you manage employees, I think it's a good idea to keep Brian Tracy's advice in mind. Practice the golden rule of management. Manage others the way you would like to be managed. Think about how managers have gotten the best effort out of you in the past and use that as you work with your employees. Just in general, when you look at policies, there's a few things to think about, some criteria for good policies. First is the policy needs to be fair. Sometimes it's easy when you're drafting policies to think only about yourself and to draft the policy that will do the most for you. But that communicates a message to your employees that you don't care about them. So you're much better off creating a system that treats the employees fairly and then to actually treat the employees fairly. Listen to them when they have complaints, address them appropriately, and move forward. Policies should also be clear and understandable. It's very easy to copy very complicated policies from some Fortune 500 company. But the problem with doing that is it's more likely to trip you up in running a small business than if you have a very simple policy that's very clear, unambiguous, and something that you can understand and the employee can understand quickly and easily. I think a lot of small business people also struggle with enforcing the rules consistently. Uh, business owners over time, as they have several employees, will develop their favorite employees. Sometimes the favorite employees are able to get away with some violations of the rules that the less favored employees aren't allowed to get away with. Over time, that's going to cause some, some problems in your uh, workforce, some envy, it's also going to cause people to try breaking rules because they've seen other people break the rules. So be sure you enforce the policies consistently. Now, by the way, when I talk about enforcement, I don't mean you need to fire someone immediately because they broke a small rule. But I do think you need to take some appropriate action so that it's clear they're not allowed to break that rule again in the future. Renewing the commitment to key policies is also important. A lot of employers, a lot of very sophisticated employers, will hand the employee a handbook, expect the employee to read the handbook on their own time and know all the policies, and never ever touch that handbook or open that handbook again until there's a problem. One way to help avoid those problems or prevent them from happening in the future is to periodically renew the, or remind the employees about the key policies. You know, certainly in a chiropractic office, one of the key policies is to protect the confidentiality of patient records. From time to time, and actually this is part of the HIPAA requirements, you should remind your employees about what some of the rules are, rules about protecting passwords, etc. But that applies to other policies as well, perhaps vacation policies or sick day policies or tardiness policies. Whichever rules are most important to you in your practice and most important in your value system, you need to periodically go over and, and remind the employees about those policies. One size does not fit all. The internet has made it very easy to find very sophisticated employee policies and handbooks from all kinds of big companies. And I've seen small businesses take policy handbooks that wind up being three or four hundred or five hundred pages long. And the problem with using that kind of handbook in a small business is it just doesn't fit. It provides for all kinds of reviews and committees and, and so forth and, and that's not something a small business owner has time for. Your policies in a small business need to be very straightforward, very simple. You need to be able to understand and know what the policies are so you can be sure that you're following your policies accurately. It's also important to update your policies. Pay attention to any changes in the law. Um, pay attention to how policies are working. 
if there's a policy that over time it's become apparent the policy is confusing or people have differing interpretations of the policy, then perhaps one answer is to uh, go back to that policy and revise it to make it a better, clearer policy. So some of the key policies, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, and, and I'm not trying to give you a, a, an outline for a handbook. I'll give you some resources that can help you with that towards the end of this lecture. But the uh, first thing is to confirm that the employees are at will. The handbook is not a contract. The employer has the right to change or amend policies at any time. The employee, on their hand, on their benefit, has the right to resign. They can resign immediately. They can do it with or without cause. And on the other hand, the employer has the right to terminate the employee immediately with or without cause. That's the definition of an at-will relationship. Now, it's also, I think, appropriate to suggest as a courtesy, the employer will, when possible, give two weeks notice, and will expect the employee to give two weeks notice as well. Uh, computer use is, can be a tricky policy. Some small businesses are a little more lenient about letting employees use the computers for personal purposes. But understand that when you do that, you expose your, your computer database to corruption, to viruses, etc. I think a better practice is to define that the computers at the desk, the computers that the employees use in business every day should only be used for business purposes. If you want to put another computer in a break room and make it available for employees' personal use, I think that's certainly an appropriate thing, but be sure that computer is not connected to the same network, that there's appropriate firewalls in place. So if a computer, if a, an employee is using a, a computer for personal uses and they inadvertently download some kind of virus or some kind of other problem, it's not going to contaminate or infect all the computers in the office. Certainly it needs to be very clear that there should not be any downloads of information or files from a computer or to a computer in the office unless it's been authorized. If you think about it, it would be very easy to walk out the door with a considerable amount of, of patient confidential information on a very small drive these days. So it's important to monitor, not just prohibit the downloads, but to have some kind of monitoring system in place so that the doctor or the network administrator, whoever is in charge of the computers, receives some kind of notice if there's a larger and unusual download. It's also good to remind employees that when they're using the business computers, they should not have any expectation and there is no right of privacy. So if they're sending personal emails on the business computer, they need to understand that even though the employer may not be trying to look at those, the employer may have access and may be able to look at those. Confidentiality of patient records. Think about the policies that are appropriate for your office. Again, this is an example where there are all kinds of policies all over the board, but you need to have a policy that's reasonable and that fits your office and provides a reasonable protection for the confidentiality of patient records. Just some general ideas. I think it's a good idea that patient records should never leave the doctor's office. Even the doctor shouldn't be taking the records home. Uh, many of the HIPAA complaints that are out there have to do with a, a, a staff member leaving a laptop or losing a laptop uh, uh, someplace where it gets lost. And that can expose information for a number, if not all, of your patients. When a response is being made to a subpoena, I recommend that in a small office the doctor should be the one who approves the release of the records to the attorney. That gives the doctor an opportunity to confirm that the subpoena is appropriate and that the information is what's requested in the subpoena and not anything in addition. Any record with patient information, any record with patient information must be shredded or destroyed before it's put in the trash. I think it's a good practice in a doctor's office for every desk to have a shredder so that it's easy for employees to shred things if they need to shred a document, 
uh, before it goes into the trash. Now, patient information, make sure your clients or your employees understand what is included in patient information. Of course, it includes the patient's name, address, phone number, uh, as well as anything about the patient's condition or treatment or billing records. So in that context, make sure your staff understands, and in fact, most if not all of the paper leaving your office should probably be shredded. The obligation to protect patient confidentiality should continue even after the end of employment, whether it's the employee quitting or the employee being fired. The employee continues to have an obligation to keep the patient information confidentiality. Good practice or good policy is to prohibit gossip about patients. Set a good example for your staff. If you see staff gossiping or you hear staff gossiping inappropriately about patients, make sure you bring it to an immediate and quick end and make sure you reprimand the staff appropriately. Now that doesn't mean you can't talk at all about patients. If a patient's being treated by several or being, working with several members of your staff, they may need to talk to each other so that they can pass the patient from one person to another. What I'm talking about is the gossip where they're, they're, they're sharing information about patients, usually not very flattering information in a context where it's not necessary. If an employee becomes aware of any identity theft or suspected identity theft, in other words, somebody is appearing and, and claiming to be a particular person or a patient and the staff member suspects it's wrong. I think it's a good practice to check uh, identification for your uh, patients. Uh, get a copy of their driver's license when they first come in. I don't think you need to do that for every visit, but certainly the first visit. But the idea here is that if your staff is aware of anything that's out of the ordinary, something doesn't seem right, they need to be aware that they need to uh, alert the doctor to that immediately so you can take appropriate action. Uh, conflicts of interest can become a problem in a small office. Uh, romantic relationships are always a challenging rule. Uh, certainly at one extreme, you can prohibit all romantic relationships with other employees, patients, or vendors. Uh, unfortunately, people spend a lot of time at work, and because of that, many romantic relationships start in that context. So it might be a better rule to, to not absolutely prohibit them, but to discourage uh, any situation where that may create a conflict of interest, and to require your employees to report that kind of romantic relationship promptly to the doctor so you can monitor and make sure everything is being handled appropriately. You may also think about accepting gifts, whether your employees should be allowed to accept gifts from vendors. Now, particularly some aggressive vendors will give some small gifts to your employees and that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, somebody brings a calendar into your employees, that shouldn't raise issues. But if it's a larger gift, like some rounds of golf at the country club, that may cause the employee to make a decision that's not in the employer's best interest. Think about embezzlement. Certainly when you hire employees, you will hire people that you trust. But sometimes people that you trust, sometimes the people that look the most trustworthy are the ones you should trust the least. Think about systems you should put in place, uh, monitoring the balance in your bank statements, uh, monitoring your, your receivables to m help prevent a, an employee from embezzling or sneaking money out of your practice. It's also a good idea to set out a basic rule on ethics and compliance. Uh, it should be very clear that your clinic's policy is to always be honest, and to always follow the rules and follow all the laws. Uh, any non-compliance should be reported to the doctor and the doctor should be aware and should address appropriately any non-compliant conduct. For more information on compliance plans, you can go to the website for the Department of Health and Human Services. That's at hhs.gov. Equal employment opportunity or non-discrimination. Uh, certainly the employer should make a statement that they are not going to discriminate on any of the inappropriate uh, bases and they should also adopt a policy that says they will not tolerate harassment by other employees 
or by vendors or by patients that's in a discriminatory manner. And there needs to be some kind of complaint process so the employees understand exactly what they should do if they see or are the victims of any kind of harassment or discrimination. Now, in addition to protecting employees, you should also protect patients from discriminatory conduct. As a place of public accommodation, uh, you are prohibited from discriminating against your patients. Uh, patient communications. Uh, remind your employees that the reason you exist is to serve your patients. Ask them to look for opportunities to provide outstanding service. Things like remembering the patient's name, addressing the patient by name, uh, treating the patient uh, uh, properly or courteously as they come into the office. Uh, it's also a good idea to remind employees that unless they're a licensed chiropractor, even though they've heard you give advice to patients, and even though they think they know what the right advice is, they should never, ever, over the phone or in person or at any other time, give advice to patients about what condition they may have, what diagnosis may be appropriate, or what treatment may be appropriate. You can explain to your employees that if they were to make a recommendation for treatment that turned out to be wrong, or if they missed the symptoms for something like a stroke or a heart attack, the consequences could be very severe uh, to the patient uh, and certainly you should take appropriate disciplinary action if you observe employees giving that advice. And I will tell you that employees will not be able to resist that temptation. They'll hear you give advice, they'll think they know the answers, and they will want to share it with your patients. Be sure they're taught not to do that. Employees should also be instructed, there should be a policy in place to require that all communications be recorded accurately. If it's a face-to-face -face communication in the office, it should be recorded in the notes in the patient's file. If it's a telephone conversation, it should be recorded in some sort of telephone log or, or some sort of uh, telephone message pad so that the doctor has a way to be aware of those communications with the patients. The most, one of the most dangerous things that can happen is a patient will come in and tell an employee, you know, I'm having this particular problem, this chest pain. And the patient will assume the employee is going to share that information with the doctor. If the employee fails to tell the doctor, hey, the patient's got a concern or a problem about this, uh, the problem may not be addressed or a bigger problem may be missed. Policy on paydays can be very simple. Which days are the paydays? Is it the 1st and the 15th? The last day of the month and the 15th? Is it every two weeks or every week? Uh, define when you're going to write the paychecks and define what pay period will be covered when you write those paychecks. Under Texas law, you're going to have to pay your employees at least twice a month. Policy should also address what deductions are made from paychecks, so there's no confusion with employees. They need to understand that you're going to make all the deductions that are required by law. The, uh, uh, certainly the federal income tax and the Social Security and Medicare taxes. And make sure they understand that so that when they receive a paycheck with those deductions, it's not a surprise to them. If you have other deductions, say for uh, benefit plans, you should not make those deductions unless you have the employee's written permission to make that deduction. Progressive discipline. Generally, the policy here should be that the employer, or the business owner, will follow a system of progressive discipline when possible. But the business owner should always reserve the right to terminate an employee immediately in the case of severe misconduct something like sexual misconduct with a patient or stealing money from the clinic is probably appropriate for immediate termination. But except in those severe cases or serious violations, ordinarily the employer should look at this as a opportunity to teach the employee how to be a better employee. If an employee has broken a rule or, or done something inappropriate, Instead of terminating the employee and going through the process of finding a new employee and training a new employee, it's usually easier to train the employee you already have. 
use a process of written reprimands. It takes a little bit of time to write down a reprimand, but I also think the way employees perceive a reprimand changes tremendously when it's put in writing. It's one thing to pull an employee aside and say, hey, I noticed you've been coming in late the last few days. Let's not do that anymore. It's something else to hand the employee a piece of paper in writing. It shows that this is a important to you as the employer, and it can also communicate to the employee very clearly that if they don't start showing up on time, that they may be subject to termination or further discipline. It just sends the message and communicates it more effectively. Now, it doesn't have to be a five-page dissertation, but a short two or three paragraph letter or a memo that says, Dear employee, you've been coming in late. I noticed you came in 15 minutes late on Tuesday and 20 minutes late on Wednesday. Please understand that this it's important to show up on time so that the office is ready when the first patient arrives. If you continue to violate the rule, uh, you may be subject to further discipline. So it's no more than a few sentences, and at the bottom it can be signed by the employee to acknowledge that they received it, not necessarily that they agree with it, but that they received it. Uh, and that just does a much better job. It's much more effective in my experience at training employees, at teaching employees, uh, the importance of following those particular rules. Uh, if you ever, well, not if ever, you will fire employees from time to time. When you fire an employee, be sure you pay their unpaid wages and any accrued vacation or any, any other benefits that they've already earned. Be sure those are paid promptly. In Texas, the Texas Payday Act requires that you pay the unpaid wages within six days after termination. You cannot wait until the next payday. Reimbursement for expenses. Make it clear to employees what expenses you may reimburse, what documentation you will expect to reimburse those expenses, or whether you, you will use some other system to incur expenses for the office. Uh, resignation. Employees, obviously, an, as an at-will employee, will have the right to resign and not required to give any notice. It's a good idea to remind them that you would prefer two weeks notice so that you can provide for a smoother transition and less interruption of patient care. It's also a good idea in connection with resignations to spell out your policy on references. And think about this one for a minute. If somebody calls for a reference and you describe the employee as a scoundrel and worthless and a liar, you've exposed yourself to a risk of defamation. Uh, and the employee may sue you, and in fact, some employers have been sued successfully for defaming or libeling former employees. A better practice is to make it clear you will provide only limited information if a reference is requested. And that information is only the dates that the employee worked for you and the title that the employee had. You will not share the employee's pay information you will not share any information about whether the employee is eligible for rehire or whether you would rehire the person. Uh, that gives the employee, exiting employees, some assurance that you're not going to interfere with their efforts to find a new job. Uh, it also helps protect you if you stick to that rule. It helps protect you from any kind of defamation claim because the only information you're providing is very factual and easy to establish that those statements were true. If you want to give an employee a positive reference, put it in writing, hand the writing to the employee, and let the employee decide who they want to share it with and when they want to share it, rather than you making those decisions. Policy on reviews and feedback. Set up a system, and, and I know that no manager likes to do reviews of employees. But that is an important part of you communicating to your employees how they are doing. Let them know what they're doing right. Let them know what they're doing wrong. Let them know how they can do things better. It's also a good opportunity for you as a manager to ask your employees, what can you do differently? How can you provide better support for them and get that information from them? Now, I think certainly the feedback should be in writing 
but it should also be a face-to-face -face conversation and not just an exchange of emails that nobody ever actually reads. Policy on substance abuse should be pretty clear. There should be zero tolerance for any substance abuse on the job. If you ever have an employee show up who has been out drinking a little bit late or using other substances inappropriately, send them out of your office. Send them home for the day. It doesn't mean they're fired necessarily, but send them home for the day. Make sure they understand the seriousness of that, of that rule and that they cannot show up for work again under the influence. Set up a system to record the time that workers work. Whether they're paid a salary, exempt or non-exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act, keep a record of the time that they work. Uh, that helps protect you if an employee, if you've miscategorized an employee. I think small business owners, many small business owners, are under the false impression that if they pay an employee a salary, then they never have to pay that employee overtime. That's a mistake. That's not what the Fair Labor Standards Act says. Fair Labor Standards Act says if the employee's duties fall within certain categories and you pay the employee a salary, then you don't have to worry about paying them overtime. But many times the Department of Labor will come back and find that you've categorized an employee in, incorrectly when they do an audit. If that ever happens to you, and you have no time record, the Department of Labor will refer to the employee and perhaps some calendar or diary the employee kept and use that to calculate the amount of overtime that you owe. So make sure you keep time records, make sure they're kept accurately, instruct your employees they should not be working off the clock. Uh, if you ever see a discrepancy employee turns in a sheet that says they worked eight hours when you know they only worked four hours that day. Don't change the employee's pay. Pay them for the eight hours, but discipline them for that in inaccuracy. And that kind of inaccuracy may, if it's anything other than the result of a clerical error, if it's an intentional mistake, uh, that may be an appropriate time to terminate the employee. Uh, when you work employees uh, more than 40 hours a week, you should pay them time and a half for the extra hours. Another mistake I've seen small business owners make is they create some kind of comp time account. And there are a few situations where that's appropriate, but for most small businesses and for a chiropractic practice, that's not appropriate. You need to pay the employees for the overtime they work, giving them extra time off at some other point in the future is not an acceptable response. Think about your policies for time off. Uh, what should an employee do if they're tardy? They're going to be out sick. Who should they contact? How should they contact you? Uh, you may prefer a text message or an email or a phone call. Uh, you may want to give the employee all three options, but you want to make it clear how the employee should communicate that to you and when they should communicate that to you so you can make an appropriate uh, arrangements to, to cover for them. You can provide paid time off. You are not required to provide paid time off. You're not required to provide any kind of vacation that's paid or sick time that's paid or holidays that are paid. You're only required to pay the employee for the hours they work in the clinic. Now, if you can afford to provide that paid time off, it's certainly a very courteous and traditional thing to do. Just understand it's not required legally, and certainly as you're starting out your practice, you may not be able to offer that. You should also adopt an attendance policy. Uh, how often should employees be allowed to be out before it becomes a problem? Think about sick time. Certainly in the chiropractic practice, you don't want employees showing up when they're sick. If they've got a bad cold or the flu and it's not, uh, uh, they need to be at home. They don't need to be in your office infecting all of your patients. Uh, vacation is something, again, that's not required, but certainly something you may offer. 
and you may choose to offer it as unpaid vacation. Same thing with holidays. How do you want to handle religious holidays? Uh, are there particular holidays or religious holidays that you will honor? And how will you accommodate employees who may belong to a religion that uh, requires that they observe holidays when you may have an ordinary work day? Uh, if you can make a reasonable accommodation, you should make a reasonable accommodation. Uh, perhaps bring somebody else in to work on that day. Uh, what about when employees need to take time off to go vote or serve on a jury or testify in response to a subpoena? You are required to give employees time off. So, for example, on voting, the polls in Texas are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you are working the employee from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., sometime during that 12-hour shift, you have to give them time to go off and vote. Uh, you don't have to pay them for that time, but you do have to give them time to go off and vote. Uh, same thing with jury duty and subpoenas. If an employee receives a, a jury summons or a subpoena, they are required to respond to that. Um, if it's a scheduling problem, depending on the circumstance, it may need be able to be rescheduled for a different time. But it is never appropriate for you as a business owner to tell your employees to ignore their jury summons or to ignore a summons. That can get you into trouble. Uh, abandonment of the job. If an employee doesn't show up for work for two or three days, uh, you should have a policy that says when the employee crosses that threshold, you're going to treat it as abandonment of the job and treat it as though the employee had quit the job. Uh, pay them out for wages that they've earned, uh, and that's the end of your obligation to it. Uh, think about breaks. Are you going to give your employees breaks? How long are the breaks going to be? When are the breaks going to be? Um, depending on the nature of your office and how large your office is, this may need to be a very regimented policy, or perhaps it can be somewhat less regimented. There's all kinds of resources on the Internet, all kinds of information out there about good employee handbooks. Uh, I recommend you look at the Small Business Administration's website. It's sba.gov. They have some good information there. Texas Workforce Commission has a publication called Especially for Texas Employers. It's available on their website. And I'll just try to show it to you real quick here. Uh, this is the table of contents. This is not the first page of it, but it, there's the uh, address for it, if that helps you. The um, uh, primary place I would recommend you look at is this appendix of sample policies and forms. These are a number of policies that they have adopted or, or not adopted, but they recommend that you look at. Certainly it's not legal advice, but it gives you some ideas of what policies are appropriate. And these are generally designed for smaller businesses. Now, in addition to these policies, there may be some policies that you need to adopt because you're providing chiropractic care, some additional confidentiality rules, etc. So think carefully about what rules you want to put in place and try to put those rules in place before you start to hire employees. Uh, there's also a number of books. Uh, I'm a big fan of Amazon.com because it's easy to find all kinds of things. There's also books available in local libraries. Uh, available for free. Uh, and of course, you can also, if you can afford to, you can also consult with an attorney to develop your employment policies. So now we've got this big book with all these policies. How do you want to communicate those rules effectively to your employees? Just putting them in a notebook someplace, I don't think really gets it done. I think it's good to have periodic reminders. Maybe there's a bulletin board where you, you put a different policy up once a month so the employees know to look for it. Uh, maybe it's something like a, a, a Ten Commandments. Maybe you've got ten rules that you think are especially important, and you want to remind employees every day about these Ten Commandments. Maybe you put some uh, uh, posters around your office. Maybe you make it a screensaver on your computers. Whatever you choose to do, it's something that's always in front of the employee to remind them 
that these are things they need to think about. You know, things like be on time uh, or things like don't say that's not my job. Take responsibility and fix the problem if you see a problem, etc. And this is not a magic list. Whatever your circumstance is, there may be different Ten Commandments, but think about what the most important rules are and, and whether it's ten or a dozen or a baker's dozen, there are only three rules. What you don't want to do is put a list up that's overwhelming. If you put up 50 rules, nobody's going to look at it. Uh, Coach John Wooden coached the UCLA basketball team to a number of national championships, NCAA championships, and he's written some books or co-authored some books on leadership. And one of the things he used to use with his teams was this pyramid of success. And what it allows you to do is to identify uh, 15 skills or tasks and put them on this kind of chart so it helps communicate to the employees uh, what we're trying to accomplish and how we're trying to to build it. There's lots of different ways to communicate the, the key rules but the important thing I want you to take away from this is don't just develop a bunch of complicated convoluted policies, stick them in a notebook somewhere and never look at them again until problems occur. Think about the rules that are important, the policies that are important to you, and make sure you remind employees that these are the rules in your workplace.